All right, guys, welcome to um, the next part of the lab, which has to do with light polarization. We just got done with um, refractive with um, image formation, and now we're going to talk about polarization. I will expand on uh, what polarization is all about, but in the meantime, I'm going to just show you the experiment. Uh, you would have watched the video before you watched this experiment. So. What are the tools we're going to use here? The tools are really basic, okay? Uh, we're going to have a light bulb, which again will be the source of light. We're going to have a reflective surface, which in this case is your workstation. I know it's black in color and most essential will absorb light by the nature of its color but as we have learned with reflection surfaces ab uh, reflect and transmit light so part of the light will be reflected and so the goal will be to adjust the light bulb in such a way that the image of the light bulb is seen on the reflective surface so we've added to this setup a transparent glass plate right a, a glass tile and the objective is to be able to clearly see the uh, image of the light bulb on the table. So that's your glass block, that's your light bulb, and we're using meter sticks to do the measurements. And then you, you can see the meter sticks on the, on the station. What I want to show you here is called a Polaroid. It allows us to polarize light rays. Polarizing light rays is like, it's, it's, it's not, it's filtering them based on the the, the 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 spin of the photons or the direction of the, the the direction of the spins of the photons let me explain usually you filter light light based on the color but sometimes you can filter light based on the direction of the spin in the photon the photons are elements of light and some of them usually are either horizontal or vertical not some, all, they're either horizontal or vertical. And sometimes what you want are only the horizontal ones. And sometimes what you want are only the vertical ones. That is, you only want photons that have spins in the horizontal direction or photons that only have spins in the vertical direction. A Polaroid allows you to filter those. If you want only the vertical, the, the photons with vertical spins, the Polaroid will allow you to get those. If you want, only want the photons with the horizontal spin, the Polaroid is gonna allow you to get, get that as well. So we're going to use the Polaroid to filter um, and then take the measurements, the data we need to collect for the calculation in this lab. So I'm going to put you guys right here, put the camera right here, not you guys, put the camera right here so you guys can watch what is going to happen. Uh, I'm going to make sure uh, we get the best experience out of this. So there we go. If I move you guys like this, which is where I will be standing, all right? If I move you guys like this, that's where I'll be standing. You can see the light right there, okay? That pond or that puddle, if you want to call it, the puddle of photons right here, emanates from the light bulb so that's the objective we want it to be here we want it to be there in such a way that it sits uh let's see if we can adjust it we want the middle stick to sit right there so let's scoot this over is that better there wasn't much change let's go the other way to really do is move the light source like that. All right, I think. All right, so if you look approximately the, the this meter stick, this one right here, the tip is inside your puddle. What you really want is for that tip to be in the center of your light puddle, right in the center. So let me see if I can make that. It's hard for me to use the camera and adjust this, so I'm really trying here. Let's 
uh, that didn't get better. Did not. Yeah, that is perfect. Awesome. So the the tip of the meter stick is at the center of that puddle. What do I do next now? What you're seeing is light rays coming out of the light bulb, striking the glass tile or the glass plate, however you want to call it, and reflecting. So part of it will be transmitted into the table, but part of it will be reflected. The reflected part come, will come towards the observer, and the observer will use the Polaroid to filter what light um, he wants to handle, right? So. When light leaves the light source, you have both vertical and horizontal spins in the photons. When it bounces off, it's the same thing. You have both vertical and horizontal spins in the photons. But with a Polaroid, we'll be able to isolate a certain group of photons, either just the vertical or just the horizontal. And when we do that, that will provide us with the data that we need for our calculations. The data we need for calculations are the distance from the puddle to where the observer is standing and the height from the surface to the eye of the observer. So you need two measurements. One of the measurements here will be the distance from the puddle to where the observer is standing, which in this case is one meter. And I will conduct the experiment. You watch me doing it and we will determine what is the height from the surface to the eye of the observer. Going to put the camera here and make sure I adjust it so you guys can see what's happening. So I had to make some adjustments here because uh, your perspective from the camera is not what I see, right? I had to move the light bulb to make sure that the puddle is at the center of my um, glass tile or my glass plate. The adjustment I made was for you to see what it really looks like, but I had to re-put it in the right position because what I see is not necessarily what the camera transcribes, okay? So I have my light puddle in the center. You probably are not seeing it in the center right now, but it's no biggie. Uh, then the next thing I will do, and I hope the camera will ask you to see me do it. So I'll stand right here and I hold my Polaroid. Let me bring you guys closer. Maybe this will work for you. So this is my Polaroid. And I will use my Polaroid to look at the, at the table, at the surface of which I'm working on. It's kind of hard to, uh, this is a particularly tricky lab because I'm not sure you guys get to see what I see. Okay, so you can see the puddle on the glass tile and I put the Polaroid there. Can you guys still see that? All right. Might have to move you guys a little bit lower. Let's see. You guys can see the puddle. And you can see. Uh, okay, you can see the phenomenon. You will not be able to see exactly what I see, but you will see the phenomenon. What will happen here is the, the puddle will get brighter or dimmer. And my objective here. My objective here is to 
I'll start down here. Uh, you can see my Polaroid is a little bit lower. And I will spin the Polaroid clockwise and counterclockwise until the light puddle, right, gets as dim as possible, right? So, I don't know if you see the phenomenon, but I see from here, and I hope you do, it gets dim up to a certain point. Okay, this, this is the dimmest it can get, and I try to go up until it gets dimmer. So I've done two things. The first thing is, I looked at the puddle through my Polaroid, then I spin the Polaroid, I spun it, in this case counterclockwise, and it diminished the brightness of the puddle. I made sure the, the puddle got as dim as possible, right? And then I move vertically. To find the spot where it's dimmer as compared to. So if I'm down here, it's dimmer. If I go up, it gets. I'm down here, it's dim. If I go up, it gets dimmer. When I'm down here, if I rotate the other way, you see it gets bright. So the first thing was to rotate it and make it dim. As dim as possible, then move upward. And make it even dimmer. Okay, this is a sweet spot. This is where it gets really dim. This height right here. So I'm getting, going to measure the height of the height, the distance between the center of my Polaroid and the surface from which the light is reflected. Let me try to do this. All right, in the sweet spot. So this is about 47 centimeters. I really hope you guys were able to see what happened. So to recapitulate, we have light leaving the light source, striking the surface, creating kind of a blur, which I call a light puddle. And I'm one meter away from that blur and I look at the puddle through a Polaroid. And I rotate the Polaroid so that it filters some of the polarized light it polarizes the light that is the right word filter is just an analogy because it has to do with filtering light based on the direction of the spin in the photons but the real term is polarized so it selects what polarity it lets true so i will spin my polaroid and minimize the light that goes through making sure that i let only light of a certain polarity to go through and when I'm done spinning the Polaroid, I will move it vertically to even further dim the light I'm seeing through the Polaroid. So spinning it made it dim, and I'll lift, I'll make it rise up to make it dimmer, and I'll stop at the dimmest point. And we found out that the distance between the center of the Polaroid and my end of my workstation, when I got the dimmest view of the light of, of the puddle, or of the light of, of the glare, if you want to call it a glare, it's fair, is 47 centimeters. So the two dimensions I needed was one meter and 47 centimeter. This data should help you um, conduct or compute uh, the results for the polarization of light. Hi everyone and welcome to uh, the lab number 13. This lab is about polarization and refractive index. Uh, off the bat, this lab will be some sort of continuation of the two previous lab. We'll have a lens involved, and we will also have um, refraction involved. And then before we will fully go into polarization. And so 
for the refract for the for the lens and refraction part of it, we will have to deal with what we call an optical bench. You will have a light source producing light rays that will go through a lens and will be refracted in order to create an image on the screen. So this is what, in general, uh, uh, the optical bench bench looks like. So you have you have your object here. The arrow is my object. Somewhere, um, somewhere along that object, I have my lens. Okay. This is obviously a concave lens, a biconvex. I'm sorry, biconvex lens, which is by definition a converging lens. That is, when rays go through that lens, they are forced to converge to one spot. And a couple of things about the lens. So, if you have a light ray that goes straight towards a converging lens. That's a light ray lens T. When it reaches the center of your lens, it is converged. It is it is refracted. I'm sorry. It's bent, and in that process of refraction, it goes through a point we are going to call F. All right. That's the focal point. So if you have an object, and the ray goes from that object. When the ray goes through the lens, it is refracted and sent through the focal point of our system. The focal point is the point where you get the best image. All right. Now, the question is, what if a ray is not coming in a parallel way? Okay. Here's another scenario. Let me try to extend this lens a little bit. Let me make it... Uh, having two equal hemisphere. That's what I'm trying here. So in the case the light ray leaving the object goes through the center of the lens, which is also called the center of curvature, that ray goes unaffected. All right? It goes straight. It goes straight through. If the light ray that is not going parallel so if we have a third line ray that is not going parallel and it's not going through the center through the center of curvature, but it's instead going through the focal point on this side. So on every lens you have two focal points. You have one to the left and one to the right of the lens. And they're usually equidistant from the center of your lens. So if the if the ray goes to the focal point that is located before the lens, it gets refracted when it reaches the center of the lens, it gets refracted into a parallel ray. All right? So usually we give names to these rays. The ray that goes to the focal point is called the focal ray. The ray that goes through the set of curvature is called the central ray. And the ray that is parallel to the surface on which the object sits is called the central ray and the focal points before and after the lens that equidistance from the center of the point of the lens these focal points are the spots where you get the best image it's just like um, for those of us who wear last glasses uh, lenses usually there's a distance at which you get a best image that distance is called the focal point of your lens, okay? Even with a human eye, there are moments when at a certain point we cannot distinguish, you know, objects, but the closer we get, we can get a better view of those of, of, of the object, and that point is a, is a focal point. Focal points are very much analogous to harmonics. Remember when we did the sound waves in the first lab, we had the first fundamental, we had the first harmonics, and so on. There were multiples of the fundamental frequency. Focal points are like harmonic. So if an object forms at a distance f from the center, if an image, a good image forms at a distance f from the center of the lens, I will also get a good image at a distance 2f, 3f, 4f from the center of the lens, okay? So this is a general idea of how 
the lenses work. So you have, if a ray is parallel, it gets converged when it goes through a converging lens. If a ray is a central ray, it goes undisturbed. If a ray is a focal ray, that is, it goes through the focal point, it is transformed into a parallel ray. And because these rays began at the tip of the arrow, what happens here is your tip of your arrow appears here now. Remember, these rays all began from the tip of the arrow here. And so when they converge here, what the observer sees, we have an observer here. What the observer sees, where the rays now meet, is the tip of the arrow. So the image has been inverted. And usually you can say an image is inverted or upright. Those are the two possibilities. So you have inverted or upright, but in this case, our image is inverted. You can have, our image looks bigger than the object, right? So we'll see the, 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 the image is magnified. But usually the question you ask yourself is, is the image diminished or magnified before you answer? Some books, instead of using diminished, they say reduced. So is the image diminished or magnified? In that case, the image is magnified. And the next thing is, our image is real. The question is usually, is the image real or virtual? I'll explain that. The question is, is the image real or virtual? In that case, the image is real, okay? Why do I say the image is real? Because the image is formed by the rays themselves. And usually that image formed by the rays themselves can be captured on the screen. When we'll conduct the experiment, you will see that the image we we'll create can be captured on the screen because the rays are real. Um, when the rays are not real, you cannot capture the image on the screen, all right? Uh, I can go on and on talking about that and how, you know, Polaroids or and our olden days cameras are really good at creating images on films or screens when they deal with real uh, 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 images and all that stuff, but I don't want, we don't have enough time for me to drag you into that. So just keep in mind that there are three types of rays involved in the formation of an image. The ray can be parallel, the ray can go to the center of curvature, or the ray can go to the focal point. And depending on where the ray goes, it determines what happens to the ray when it goes out of the lens. If the rays goes into the lens parallel to this axis, it is, it is bent towards the focal point, towards and through the focal point. If the ray goes towards, through the center of curvature, it goes undisturbed. If the ray goes through the focal point before the lens, it is bent parallel to the axis, all right? And in case the image was formed at the focal point, then we have a focus, and that is we have the best possible image. And an image is described by three properties. Is the image can be inverted or upright. That has to do with the, pos the posture of the image. The image can be reduced or magnified. That has to do with the size of the image. And the image can be real or virtual. That has to do with the, uh, what term will we use here to describe the authenticity of the image. Now I know we don't only deal with converging lenses. Uh, we have divergent, divergent lenses. I don't know if I should show you an example of a divergent lens. Let me just do it anyway. Uh, let me give you an example of a divergent lens, then we'll go into the lecture for today. So let's suppose instead of a converging lens, our green eye observer there has a divergent lens. All right? Okay, that lens is a little bit higher than the position of our observer. So let's put the lens here. Here's a central axis. I put my object here. I have my parallel ray that comes here. And when you reach the center of my divergent lens, it is refracted. But remember, this is a divergent lens. So it is Diverge, it is bent away from the central axis in such a way that if I extrapolate that bent ray 
it will land on the focal point before the lens. So a parallel ray comes, a parallel ray comes, it is bent. Let me make this look a little bit more acceptable. It is bent away from the central axis. And when you extrapolate it, it lands on the focal point. A ray going through the focal point will go undisturbed, right? And a ray, uh, no, sorry, a ray going, going through the focal point will be made parallel when it steps out of the lens, all right? And a ray going through the center of curvature will go undisturbed, all right? What is the net result here? Here's what happens. This ray that went through the focal point and came out parallel is extrapolated as well, backwards. The ray that went through, that came parallel and that was bent away from the normal has been extrapolated. So here is where the meat. The ray that the central ray that went through the center of curvature, nothing happened to it. So, boom, big deal. Nothing really happened to it. So, we cannot really use it to create the ray. But what we can do here, though, is look at this. These two rays that have been extrapolated are formed here to produce the tip, the tip of an object. So this is the object, then the image is here. The image is formed behind the lens, in front of the lens before in front of the lens not close to the observer eyes in the in the convergent lens case it was close to the observer eyes in the divergent lens is formed elsewhere all right let me take out the central ray since it brings nothing to um, a setup here so our image is formed here and as you can see that image is inverted uh, it is um diminished and it's virtual it's virtual because it's not produced by the rays it's actually produced by the extrapolation of the rays okay so that's 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 it for the divergent lens about today's lab here's what we actually do we'll not always draw fancy stuff for experiments today's lab is a central axis we have our object standing here we have our lens here we we'll represent the lens with a straight line and what we saw, we'll see is that a light ray will come out there and go that way, right? That's the parallel ray. Then we'll have the central. Now, I don't expect this to be state of the art, right? I'm not using anything fancy to be able to claim that I have the best drawing here, but I'm just trying to. That's a, that was the central ray. Then we have the focal ray. That's my focal ray. So let me, let me use different color codes to make things easy. My object is purple here. All right. Here's my parallel ray, here's my central ray, and here's my focal ray. All three rays meet here to produce my object. And as you can see, my object is enlarged, inverted, and real. But what really matters to me is how do I know the value of this focal point. I just know it is a focal point, but how do I know what value it is? Like, if I give you a lens, I need to tell you what the focal point of that lens is. In order to find the focal distance or to know the position of the focal point, what we do in our experiment is we will keep moving this lens back and forth until the image forms until the image that is formed 
is the best no well until we have an image a clear image formed on our screen our screen here in, in our children my screen will be a piece of paper our screen here is considered to be the observer eyes right um, or at least this surface here this is where our screen is where we see the image formed in order to find the focal point a couple of things you need to find what is the distance from the object from the object to the lens. Let me use another color. Let me use red. So the distance from my object to the lens, I'm going to call that O. And then what about the distance of my image from the lens? I call that I, okay? So O is the distance of the, of, of the image of the object from the lens, and I is the distance of the image from the lens. So in order to find F, F is the focal point. In order to find the focal point for which this distance is baptized the focal distance. So the distance of the focal point from the lens is called the focal distance. In order to find the focal point, here's the formula I use. The reciprocal of the focal distance is the reciprocal of the object distance plus, plus the reciprocal of the image distance. All right? What that means is my focal distance can be obtained by multiplying image and object distance and then dividing it by the sum of image and object distance. These two formulas are what matter, right? And when we conduct the experiment, I will provide you with those values. Um, there will be a meter stick, and I will clearly, clearly tell you, remember, the uncertainty of the meter stick is one millimeter. And the experiment will tell you, hey, the object distance is this, the image distance is this. Go ahead and find the focal distance as well as the uncertainty of the focal distance.